It is late evening on the same day when the curtain rises at the beginning of Act 3, Scene 2. The dugout is lit quite festively, with an unusual number of candles. Two champagne bottles stand prominent on the table. Dinner is over. The men are clearly drunk. Stanhope is lounging across the table with one elbow among the plates and mugs. His hair is ruffled and there is a bright red flush on his cheeks. While Trotter's face is a shiny scarlet with deep red patches below the ears. They have eaten well, as evidenced by the fact that Trotter is bursting out of his tunic. The three bottom buttons of his tunic are undone, and now and then his hand steals gently over his distended stomach. They are finishing off the meal with cigars. The mood has changed dramatically since the immediate aftermath of the raid in the previous scene. The men appear on the surface to be relaxed and having a good time, but the atmosphere is one of forced, almost febrile gaiety as they strive to forget, just for a short time, the imminent onset of tomorrow's attack, as well as Osborne's death, which has been a stark reminder of their own mortality. Never has the saying, eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die, seemed so appropriate. Notice how Hibbert's thin white fingers are nervously twitching the ash from his cigar, and how his laugh is high-pitched and excited, suggesting barely suppressed tension. Note also how neither of the two men from whom we first learnt about this meal, Osborne and Raleigh, are here to enjoy it. Osborne for obvious reasons, while Raleigh's absence is more of a mystery at this point. It will be interesting to see, now that Osborne is no longer there as a unifying force, how this will affect the dynamic between the men. The scene starts in the middle of Stanhope telling a funny anecdote about an encounter with a French woman, where his trousers seem to have had a starring role which has Trotter and Hibbert in fits of drunken laughter. It's a moment of light relief after the drama of the raid and the death of Osborne. There is still an undercurrent of tension. We only come in at the punchline, but it's enough to be able to tell that Stanhope's story is somewhat risque. I simply drew myself up and said, Very well, mademoiselle, have it your own way. And she did. No, she didn't. Again, the others laugh. Trotter wipes a tear from his eye. Hibbert starts to tell his own story about a couple of tarts that he picked up one night. Note how while Stanhope's was witty, his is just unpleasant, and our antipathy for him grows as he talks about women in a derogatory manner and demonstrates that he takes pleasure from having treated them in a very ungentlemanly fashion. And those tarts began cursing me like hell, said I'd done it on purpose. I said if they didn't damn well shut up, I'd chuck them both out in the road and leave them. We can tell that Stanhope neither likes nor appreciates Hibbert's sense of humour or attitude towards the opposite sex, as he ironically responds, Hurrah, that's the idea. Treat them rough. Trotter doesn't seem too impressed either and changes the subject, remarking that he never had no motor car. My old lady and me used to walk. Legs is good enough for me. Up until the middle of the 20th century, when they began to be mass-produced in factories, cars would have been a luxury item and so would have been out of reach for working-class men such as Trotter. This reminds us of the differing backgrounds of these officers who are equal and yet unequal. Trotter's reference to Shanks's mare or Shanks's pony, which is slang for using your own legs as a means of getting from A to B, otherwise known as walking, and the way in which neither Stanhope nor Hibbert has ever heard of the term, also shines a spotlight on their different social classes. Note how Hibbert mocks Trotter's turn of phrase, clearly seeing him as a figure of fun to look down on, as he is now not laughing with him, but at him. 
Hibbert, almost screaming with delight. Oh, Trotter, you're a dream. This doesn't escape Trotter, who responds in kind, turning a baleful eye on Hibbert. You've had too much champagne, you have. Hibbert now takes a leather case from his pocket and produces some picture postcards, which are presumably saucy photographs of scantily clad women, and he hands them one by one to Stanhope, smiling up into Stanhope's face for approval. Stanhope and Trotter appear unimpressed, commenting that the ladies are either too fat or scraggy. Don't forget that Stanhope and Trotter are unlikely to be a receptive audience, as Trotter has, on a number of occasions, referred to his old lady, or his wife, and Stanhope is, of course, in love with Raleigh's sister. It's hardly surprising, then, that when Hibbert brings up that show Zip at the Hippodrome, Stanhope suddenly becomes weary and is not keen to continue the conversation, as this is a reminder of how he spent his last leave in self-imposed exile, rather than go home and risk Madge seeing what he's become. Stanhope calls to Mason to bring some whisky, and Trotter brings the conversation back round to his favourite subject, food. Anyhow, it was a jolly fine bit of chicken, and I'd go a mile any day for a chunk of that jam pudding. Mason not only brings the whisky, but also the bad news that this is the last bottle, and that they've already got through five since they arrived there. There's a moment of pathos and tension as Stanhope declares that this will last till sunrise. He turns to Trotter and Hibbert. Sunrise tomorrow, my lads. Of course, we know that sunrise is when the Germans are expected to mount the attack on the British lines and that they are not likely to need the whisky afterwards because they'll probably all be dead. The conversation at last turns to Raleigh. It seems that he is up in the trench on duty and Trotter gives his opinion that it's a pity he didn't come down to supper. Stanhope reveals that it's not because he wasn't expected to be there. I told him to. I told him to come down for an hour and let the sergeant major take over. Hibbert drops the bombshell that Raleigh told him that he liked being up there with the men better than down here with us. It seems as though Hibbert takes an almost malicious pleasure in grassing Raleigh up to Stanhope, even though he dresses it up in self-righteous indignation. I told him about the chicken and the champagne and cigars, and he stared at me and said, You're not having that, are you? Just as if he thought we were going to chuck it away. Trotter jumps to Raleigh's defence. He has clearly made a favourable impression on him, suspecting that the raid shook him up more than we thought and commending him for his bravery. He's got pluck, strong lad too, the way he came back through the smoke after that raid, carrying that bosh under his arm like a baby. This is, however, all water off a duck's back as far as Stanhope is concerned. Raleigh has snubbed him, and he feels judged by the young boy for going ahead with a celebratory dinner, when Osborne's body is still out there on the battlefield. He becomes instead fixated on the fact that Raleigh has betrayed his officer rank because it is something that he can feel justified in calling him out on. He actually told you he preferred being up with the men better than down here. Talking about the raid clearly makes him uncomfortable. It obviously reminds him of the guilt he feels for Osborne's death and he takes this out on Trotter who is justifiably surprised at his reaction. Oh, for God's sake, forget that bloody raid. Think I want to talk about it? No, but after all, well, shut up. All right, all right. Hibbert is unwilling for the party to end so soon, and he tries to interest the men in another one of his stories. The moment has passed, however, and Sanhope has obviously had enough of him as he tries to shut him down. Did I ever tell you the story about the girl I met in Soho? I don't know. I expect you did. It'll amuse you. I'd been to a dance and I was coming home quite late. Yes, and it's late now. You go on duty at eleven. You'd better go and get some sleep. The champagne and what he has perceived as weakness in Stanhope in Act 2, Scene 2, when Stanhope shared his own fears with him, 
have made him bold, and he thinks he can be overly familiar and speak to him in a disrespectful manner. Well, you better go to bed. There's silence. Stanhope looks at Hibbert, who sniggers. What was that you said? I was only joking. I asked you what you said. I said you better go to bed. Stanhope unceremoniously orders Hibbert to get out of my sight, which, shocked, he promptly does, leaving Stanhope alone with Trotter. Stanhope can no longer conceal his contempt for Hibbert, asking Trotter, Doesn't his repulsive little mind make you sick? I envy you, Trotter. Nothing upsets you, does it? You're always the same. We briefly get a glimpse here of Trotter's otherwise hidden depths as he responds, Always the same, am I? He sighs. Little you know. But the moment passes as Trotter subtly changes the topic from how he feels emotionally to how he feels physically after having overeaten. I feel all blown out now. As far as Hibbert's concerned, Trotter, in contrast to Stanhope, rather pities him, remarking about his postcards, which Hibbert has forgotten to take with him. Funnier bloke carrying pictures like this about. Satisfies his lust, I suppose. Poor little fella. Trotter exits to relieve Raleigh up in the trench, having just been told that he is to replace Osborne as Stanhope's second in command. Stanhope is briefly alone on stage, brooding over the table. He orders Mason to bring in Raleigh's dinner. He's clearly planning to have a showdown with him over it and demand that he eat it as a point of principle. How Stanhope addresses this will be interesting. By taking a moral stance, Raleigh is effectively saying that the others have been somehow immoral in partaking in the meal, and this is what Stanhope is most upset about. We know that his getting drunk and acting cheerful is not only a way of keeping up the morale of the rest of the company, who are facing almost certain death the next morning, but it's also his coping mechanism. If he gives way to his grief, he will be incapable of functioning. When Raleigh enters, there is an obvious awkwardness between the pair. He hesitates at the bottom of the stairs, repeating himself and stumbling over his words when Stanhope immediately confronts him over not having come down to eat. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't think you... Uh. Note how Stanhope puts him on the spot, demanding that he finish what he started to say. Well, you didn't think I... Uh, what? I didn't think you'd... You'd mind, if I didn't. Rather, however, than downright refusing to eat the meal, Raleigh reveals that he's not hungry because he had something to eat up there. This gives Stanhope all the ammunition he needs to give him a dressing down, without touching on the real reason of his annoyance. Now look here, I know you're new to this, but I thought you'd have the common sense to leave the men alone to their meals. Do you think they want an officer prowling round eating their rations and sucking up to them like that? My officers are here to be respected, not laughed at. Note how Stanhope and Raleigh now communicate over the next four lines in a back and forth of rhetorical questions to indicate the extent to which they are poles apart as they refuse to understand one another. Why did they ask me if they didn't mean it? Don't you realise they were making a fool of you? Why should they? So you know more about my men than I do. Raleigh tries to diffuse the situation by offering an apology of sorts, although notice how it is conditional, communicating that he doesn't really feel as though he's done anything wrong. I'm sorry then, if I was wrong. He seems to think that it's the end of the matter, but Stanhope has other ideas, suddenly shouting at him to sit down. Stanhope now launches the next prong of his attack. Raleigh's comment to Hibbert and his perceived disloyalty to his fellow officers. In response to what can only be described as an interrogation by Stanhope, where he demands to know why he didn't come down to dinner, Raleigh is disingenuous as he beats about the bush. I... I wasn't hungry. I had rather a headache. It's cooler up there. 
Stanhope responds by telling him that he insulted Trotter and Hibbert by not coming. You realise that, I suppose? Now he is the one being disingenuous. Note how neither of them so far has addressed the elephant in the room. Matters come to a head when Rani notices that Stanhope's hand trembles so violently that he can scarcely take the cigar between his teeth. Riley looks at Stanhope, fascinated and horrified. Stanhope immediately reacts and challenges Riley to tell him if he sees anything funny about him. Riley instead turns the tables, becoming proactive rather than reactive, which throws Stanhope as he remarks, I'm awfully sorry, Dennis, if, if I annoyed you by coming to your company. We're beginning to get closer to the heart of the matter, but Stanhope now on the back foot, refuses to engage. I don't know what you mean. I resent you being a damn fool, that's all. And tries to get Raleigh back onto the safer topic of eating his dinner. It is now Raleigh who loses his temper, his words finally laying bare what all of this is actually about. Good God, don't you understand? How can I sit down and eat that when... His voice nearly breaking. When Osborne's... Lying. Out there. Stanhope's words, punctuated by Raleigh's challenges and questions, bring the scene to its heart-rending climax as he finally lays his soul bare. My God, you bloody little swine. You think I don't care. You think you're the only soul who cares. The one man I could trust. My best friend. The one man I could talk to as man to man who understood everything, and you think I don't care. But how can you when... To forget, you little fool, to forget. Do you understand? To forget. You think there's no limit to what a man can bear? Raleigh is suitably mortified, but his attempts to reconcile with Stanhope fall on stony ground, with Stanhope screaming at him to get out and leave him alone. Rather than bring them together, this moment of searing honesty has just pushed them further apart as we prepare to go into the final scene, leaving the audience wondering how the problems in their relationship can ever be resolved. The curtain falls on a solitary Stanhope, while the very lights rise and fall outside, softly breaking the darkness with their glow, sometimes steel blue, sometimes grey. Through the night there comes the impatient grumble of gunfire that never dies away. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.